was good. They they did good on the racist issue and the all the issues actually in this episode and not caring what other people think about you. I, I they did really good. I like this one. I really enjoyed it. For me, this is what Quantum Leap is. Episodes like this, The Color of Truth, upcoming episodes. I mean, they're really good. I really enjoyed all the actors. And as promised, we have an interview with Kay Callen. We are pleased today to have with us a legend of stage and screen, Miss Kay Callen. Callan's professional career began at Margot Jones Theater in her hometown of Dallas, and she has continued through regional, off-Broadway, Broadway, films, and television. Her big break came with her first film role, Joe. Her portrayal of Peter Boyle's mousy wife brought her glowing reviews in the New York Times. A voting member of both the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Callan is also a past member of the board of directors of the Screen Actors Guild. Her most visible television role was playing Superman's mom in the ABC hit comedy Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. A regular on four television series and a guest star on scores of episodes, Callan has played a demented Miss Daisy for Tyler Perry on Meet the Browns and a crime boss on The Mentalist. But of course, Quantum Leap fans know her as Lenore McKenzie from the Americanization of Machiko. How are you, Miss Callan? I'm just fine. Thank you. I'm happy to hear from you. I really enjoyed this episode, and uh, you played a really good part in it. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about the whole experience of filming Quantum Leap? Oh, golly, it was a really long time ago. Uh, I remember we shot it over at Universal, uh, and I remember um, fondly how what a lovely person Scott was. Uh, and everybody in, involved with it was just terrific. And the other thing is that I'm always amazed at people on the street who come up, I mean, this is however many years later, come up to me and remember that episode and can quote things from it that I can't even quote. Um, but it was, it, was a, it was a very interesting thing to film. Do you remember anything about your character? Like, was it difficult to play maybe a little bit of a racist or at least... Uh, someone struggling with uh, the guilt of not helping her daughter, so she eventually committed suicide. Well, um, of course, all of the all of the above. Um, but you know, as actors, our whole job is to be able to go to all these places and play these things. And as far as the racist element of it, um, probably we all know people who are like this that we go, "Oh my goodness," and we kind of absorb you know, what that's like and have the ability to kind of play that back to someone and those feelings. You know, she was filled with so many different emotions, you know, that her son was back, that she'd lost her daughter, that her son was back, and now she's kind of lost her son to this woman who is somebody. And in that particular time, you know, we were, uh, the Japanese people were, you know, up in concentration camps, they didn't call them that, but in camps up, you know, in Northern California, they'd all been, you know, taken away from regular life. And so I think that there was a lot of prejudice, you know, the same kind of prejudice that exists today for various groups. So um, there was that, and, and it was a pleasure to play the part where she finally comes to a place where she understands that she was wrong and she makes the right moves. I originally saw this episode when it first aired, and I was uh, probably a young teenager, and the ending of that really uh, touched my heart, seeing your character in a kimono at the end. Yeah, it was it was fun to wear that kimono, too. And yeah. you know what? I don't believe I have seen that episode since, you know, since I saw it on television when we did it. You know, back in those days, we didn't have uh, recording ability to, you know, keep a copy of something and save it. Uh, and I don't know whether, I, I don't remember having seen it someplace, you know, where I could have recorded it or gotten a copy of it. So I haven't seen it way since that time. It's a pretty good episode. It really holds up. Uh, I think it's out on DVD and it's on Netflix and all that stuff. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to Netflix that and take a look at it myself. I'm sure a lot of listeners would like to know a little bit about your experience on Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Uh, well, uh, not a not a bad moment. Um, 
I, uh, as a matter of fact, I've been talking a lot about Lois and Clark lately because it's it's 20 years since we did Lois and Clark, and it's like the 75th year of Superman. And so there have been a lot of um, press and, and online things about that. And uh, I actually, it's so interesting that you asked that because tomorrow I am having lunch with Deborah Joy Levine, who created the show, and Bob Butler, who directed our pilot. Um, so it's it's not all lost down in history. You know, we're still all talking to each other and and reminiscing about, oh, those days. You are still on television today in all kinds of television shows. Uh, a lot of my favorites, like How I Met Your Mother, that was a very funny part you did. That was a wonderful thing I got to do. It was just so much fun. And that show, that particular show plays so much. What was your experience like on uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine? I'm a big Star Trek fan, and... Uh, I probably first recognized you from that. Well, actually, that was probably the most interesting story of all because I had to have a prosthetic for that. And so I had to go in, you know, on a particular day and, you know, they put that cast on you, which I withstood a lot better in those days than I do these days because I can't remember what I worked on. Oh, I guess when I was on Nip Tuck, they did another one and I had to be under that stuff. And it's, it's quite an ordeal. But anyway, so we, they did that, and so that means that every morning you would come to work, you know, at 5 in the morning, and it was a long time that they put that on you, and then at night you might finish at 10 at night, and they've already built another hour in for them to take it off. And when we first started shooting it, I was like, oh, my God, this is so interesting. How interesting this is. Oh, this is so much fun. And then by the by the last day that I was shooting, it was like, Oh my goodness, the poor people who are on this show every day and have to put all this stuff on. I mean, that's that's a very big deal. It's a very big deal. Yeah, uh, from what I understand, you get to a point where you just can't wear it any longer. Well, I think you just, you know, I just, one would have, one would have thought before they were on that show, before I was on that show, oh, wouldn't it be great to have a job on this every day? And it was like, no, it really wouldn't be. <laughs> it's just, you know, you're there, you never see the sun. You know, you get there before the sun comes up and you leave way after it's down and you've spent all this time in makeup. And if it were a movie, you know that there's an end date, but if it's a popular television series, that's not the way it goes. Besides being an accomplished actress, you're also an author. Uh, yes, I have a, a series of books for actors, writers, and directors about how to get work in the business. They're marketing books. They they don't tell you how to act, write, or direct, but once you know how to do that, and now you're, you know, most people are like, well, I can figure out how you do that, but how do you ever get a job? So I did a lot of research, and so I have books for those folks. I saw your uh, film on uh, your books in the bookstore. That was oh, yes, right, right. Uh, I enjoy doing that. And uh, Suzanne uh, Ky- Kylie, who is in it with me, uh, she's a young actress that I had known, and I asked her to be in it with me. And she gave me the two biggest laughs in it, so I gave her co-writing credit because she's, she's just a brilliant comedian and writer, and I'm so happy that she did that with me. If anybody's interested in these books, uh, some of the titles are The Los Angeles Agents Book, How to Sell Yourself as an Actor, The Script is Finished, Now What Do I Do?, and among many others. And uh, where can they find copies of that? Uh, Well, they're at bookstores, but also they can go to kcallen.com, and there'll be a whole page with all the books, and you can see what book and what they're about and order one if you want to. But they're also at Barnes & Noble and like that. My mom actually wanted me to uh, tell you that you were on her favorite episode of All in the Family. Oh, that was a wonderful episode. What a what a gift that I got to do that. Um, that is a an episode that has changed many lives. That was quite a groundbreaking episode in its day because it was back to prejudice. It was about uh, gay prejudice. And it was right when... Anita Bryant, for those people who are old enough to know who that was, who was a big orange juice spokesman and a very, and maybe she'd been a big singer or something. I think that's why she was a celebrity and did that. And anyway, she'd come out with this big campaign against school teachers, any school teachers being gay or whatever. And so that was the whole theme of this had to do with that. And uh, I've had people stop me all over the world um, and all these years later and say, that episode changed my life. You know, I was like 10 years old 
And my parents, you know, were very prejudiced about gay people, and I dare not say who I was. And then after that episode, my dad was like, well, gosh, I guess they're they're just regular people. And, and it's, it's, it was a wonderful show, but they won Emmys for it and well-deserved and, and so happy to have been a part of that. I watched it a few days ago, and it still holds up really well. And I think it's still relevant for uh, today's times. There's still a lot of uh, prejudiced people out there that just don't get it. Yes, there are. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, although, as you, as this guy said, you know, it, it really changed his parents' viewpoint. But I think people who are in their bones so prejudiced, I don't know what's going to change that. Unless, you know, somebody in their family turns out to be gay, and then they have to deal with it. Although sometimes... You know, the person in your family is gay and you don't deal with it. You just never speak to him again. So, Well, hopefully shows like uh, that episode of All in the Family and uh, many episodes of Quantum Leap uh, might yeah. might educate people or at least get them thinking about their beliefs. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, there has been so much change over these years, you know, uh, in so many areas, you know, gay and the whole uh, African-American experience and everything that... Yeah, although there's a lot of, as you say, a lot of folks who, who are still prejudiced and so forth, but there has been a lot of, a lot of progress. Probably due in part a lot to uh, people seeing stuff like this and uh, being able to talk about it and not just keeping quiet on the subject. Yes, uh, I, I think that's, and the other thing is, and so important, is people who are not prejudiced having the courage to speak up when they're talking to their friend, who it turns out is prejudiced, instead of just being quiet and just letting it go by, you know, people who have the courage to to speak up and say, well, hey, what are you talking about? And I don't feel that way. I think that makes a big difference. I like that. That makes a lot of sense. And I think that's why everything seems to be getting better, I hope. Well, I remember uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and I was living in Norman, Oklahoma at the time. And it was, and I had been in Dallas when Kennedy was assassinated. And but when Martin Luther King was assassinated, I remember writing an editorial to the newspaper there, saying, you know, that I had been at parties where bigoted people would, you know, take off against the, the black community, and I would just, you know, not want to make fuss and et cetera, and just kind of blend into the woodwork. And I just said, this will never happen again. You know, I'm never going to just stand there when somebody is saying something and not speak up. Because when you don't speak up, you're just nodding assent. They just assume you agree. Very true and very uh, brave to do that also, especially back then. Well, you know, it's it's still always hard to be in a group where everybody else says yes and you're saying no or vice versa. You were uh, born in Dallas, Texas, right? I was. So, I was. like you and said. my kids were all born there, too. So, although we've been, you know, gone from there for many years. Being in Dallas or Texas when the president got assassinated, what was that like for you? Oh, well, it was a horrible day for Dallas. Um, couldn't believe it. Although, um, at that point in time, Dallas was, well, Adlai Stevenson had been there some months before, and he'd been, you know, how people are holding placards, this thing signed, you know, that say whatever, and somebody had hit him on the head with one of those signs. And there were those of us who were uneasy and did not think it was a good idea for Kennedy to come because it was just very, you know, very hateful at that time. And and so, I mean, we left shortly after that. I was happy to move away. I, I mean, I've been back since then, and I love Dallas, and my family is there. But it was a dark time. Such a horrible thing would happen. Nothing like that had ever happened on U.S. soil. You just can't believe that. Yeah, it still affects people to this day, and it happened over 50 years ago now. Yeah. Quantum Leap actually does a two-part episode dealing with the assassination of Kennedy. Did you ever see that? I think I did, but my memory is totally dim on it on this day. I don't remember anything about it. A lot of people might remember you from Joe. Could you tell us a little bit about the movie from 1970? Well, that was a long time ago. You're saying all my oldest credits. Uh, that was another movie about prejudice. Uh, and that was a very exciting thing that happened. I was living in New York then. Um, I got this part in this movie that everybody associated with it thought, well, this is a movie no one is ever going to see because it was an, an independent movie that cost, you know, about 25 cents to make. And I think we each got paid a nickel. 
but um, the movie came out, and the movie was successful. But almost simultaneously, I don't know whether you remember this, uh, the Kent State Massacre happened, which mirrored the events in the film. And so then the film really took off. As frequently happens, the movie comes out, and then in a short period of time, something will happen in the real world that is the same thing. And then it really catches fire. And that certainly happened in that film, which was um, the story of uh, Peter Boyle. The, the, he became a big star in that movie, a hard hat who, uh, and it was during, um, you know, the 70s when, you know, the East Village and hippies and love, peace, make make love, not not war, all that whole thing was happening. He was he was very prejudiced and against the youth and against you know the hippies and so forth. And Susan Sarandon, it was her first film, and and she became a star out of it, or certainly well on her way to her career. And uh, so it was it was a pretty thrilling movie for all of us. Very interesting experience. Very hard to watch at times, especially uh, Peter Boyle in the bar going on and on about yeah. different racism yeah. things. But you know, it's important yeah. important and though. He really. He really um, wrote a lot of that. He he was somebody who had been in Second City in Chicago, and he was a great improviser. And kind of that character um, was a character that he kind of had in his pocket, that belligerent, you know, bigoted guy. And so the movie was originally called The Gap, as in The Generation Gap, and it was more centered on Susan and her father, the, the advertising guy played by Dennis Patrick, but then when they cut it all together and they saw what they had in this performance with Peter, then the whole movie changed focus and it became Joe. And, uh, and it would not have been the success it was had they not refocused it that way. Um, very good movie. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you should for our listeners. Um, uh, most recently, you've been working on Getting On, the TV series. You play yes, Su- yes. Susan Dayward. Yes. <laughs> yes. Poor Susan Dayward, who came into the hospital for a routine operation on her knee, said she was a runner and she was being proactive to make things better, and she left in a wheelchair and will never walk again. Will never run again. She can walk sometime, but not run. What part do you get recognized for the most? I think probably Superman's mom. Uh, certainly when somebody stops me on the street and says, I know you, I know you, I try never to, I try to just say, oh, well, yeah, I've done a lot of stuff. And they'll say, well, what? And I'll say, oh, please, you know, I'll start naming things and you'll say, no, no, no. And then pretty soon we'll both feel really stupid. (laughs) But I will usually start off with, well, I was in a series 20 years ago. I played Superman's mom and they'll go, oh, yeah. But a lot of people recognize me from a series I did for Tyler Perry. Meet the Browns, that's what it was called. People recognize me from that, which is surprising to me because I wore all kinds of wigs and I played this um, old big star who's in this retirement home. Uh, and I'm, I'm, it's kind of like a Norma Desmond type. I'm constantly caught in all of my old movies and, you know, doing movie lines. And, oh, my God, I had the most wonderful wardrobe. I had all these clothes from, like, the 40s that they had, you know, that I got to wear. And I just come into another into another uh, scene for no particular reason, you know, in a ball gown or something. <laughs> it was, so I'm always surprised when people recognize me from that. Uh, I did about 20 episodes of, of that show so a lot of people recognize me from that i've not seen that one but it sounds and, good i want to check it out uh it, 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 it was uh i wasn't uh, i was on the first couple of seasons and then not on anymore but I, I loved the part i had i got to wear great clothes and be totally outrageous and i did an episode on there with rue mcclanahan you should uh YouTube or see if you can find that someplace because that was a really good episode which she played my sister oh wow that would be good I'm going to check yeah. that one out uh, so many parts you've had deal with issues like uh, you know gay or lesbian and racism different things like that do you search those parts out or it just happen to come along oh I think that just happens you know they, they got the you know writers are looking for something interesting to write about looking for conflict and um you know, so I've still I've gotten some of those, but you know, when I was on the closer, I mean, so many things that haven't been like that. It's just that some of some really really good ones have been. 
I'm doing a play right now that's in Los Angeles, so I don't know, you know, how many of your uh, listeners are from Los Angeles, called yeah. RX, as in Prescription, and it's at a small theater called The Lost Studio, and we play until the end of February. Ooh, I wish I lived there. I could check it out. Where do you live? Uh, Southwest Florida. Florida. Well, yeah, that would be quite a trek for you to come here for that. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for talking with me today. It was a real honor, and uh, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Fun to talk about Quantum Leap again. You know, brings a bunch of stuff up to my brain that I'd forgotten about. That was a great interview with Kay Callen. It was amazing to talk to her. And it's 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 amazing to just sit and watch an episode of television and then a few days later be talking to the person that was on that episode and played in a very important character in the episode. Yeah, she seemed like a really cool person to talk to and very nice. Very nice. Uh, couldn't have been more accommodating. It's cool that she, you know, remembers the internment camps and stuff like that, too. It's crazy to think back that we had that history. So to talk to someone who was there and she could bring that into the episode, you know? Uh, very recent history. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things. Right. And if you like interviews, we have another exciting interview scheduled for next episode, so stay tuned for that. Yeah, I'm really excited about next time. A little bit, a little bit. Are you nervous? Oh, yeah. <laughs> kind, kind of a big deal. Yeah. You guys are dying to know, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs>